This is the regular meeting of the Boulder County Board of Health. Date is Monday, January 9th, 2023. Happy New Year. And without further ado, we will go ahead and get started. Uh, as you can see, the board is all in person uh, today. And so, but we are still doing hybrid options and uh, according to statute and bylaws. So, Happy New Year. Uh, item one, public comments. There are no public comments. No public comments, thank you. Item two, approval of December 12th, 2022, regular meeting minutes. I move to approve the December 12th, 2022, regular meeting minutes. Second. Okay, motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Item three, approval and adoption of Boulder County legislative priorities and discuss upcoming legislative session. We have Mark Rosen and Summer Laws who are back with us and Happy New Year. We also have Nick Robles with us online. Yes, there's Nick. Nick. And um, good evening, everyone. I'm not sure if somebody has a hand. Somebody has a hand to introduce this or not. But okay. Lane, would you like to introduce the group? Lane or there's two. Yeah, is there? Is that Ryan who wants uh, to make Yes, but Ryan did not submit uh, request to, to speak. <clears throat> so. I think we can take a couple of board. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm happy to introduce Mark's group. Um, so I think Mark. Oh, hold on, and, Lane. Sorry, hold on, Lane. Hold on a second, Ryan. You didn't sign up for public comment, but we'll go ahead and let you make public comment. So please go ahead. All right, Ryan, I've made you a presenter. You should be able to unmute. Super. Thanks much. I appreciate it. Did, uh, is, does that request have to be in by noon? It has to be in by 5.30, so like right when the meeting okay. starts. I, I, I did submit it, and I got a confirmation. So, so okay, I'll double check. FYI. Sorry about that. Yeah, thanks much. Anyways, just circling back, I saw the uh, Boulder County Public Health pushing out more meetup for the meetup to get vaccinated, um, yada, yada. I, I find I find the uh, voice coming from Boulder County Public Health to be just very intellectually lazy and very one sided uh, all throughout COVID now. Um, I find that very unfortunate. I don't think three minute comments from the public really accomplish anything, but uh, you do have a large contingent of the community that's uh, dissatisfied with your decision making for the past two years, myself included. Um, the COVID vaccine is dangerous, causing severe adverse effects left and right. Uh, the whole narrative is completely unraveling, and yet there's no mention, there's no pause, there's no consideration of this other perspective internally at Boulder County Public Health. You guys just continue down the same road. Everyone needs to be vaccinated regardless of age. There's never any adverse effects. Um, I just, I just find it to be true just unfortunate very unfortunate you can't take pause or try and engage the other side uh i was vilified during this time due to all the restrictions you threw around left and right uh local business owner i spoke with plenty of others and your actions were very predatory i don't think they did a single thing as uh reference now if you were to drag back on data lockdowns did not help at all so that's just an example um i would say try and expand your view children's health defense steve kirsch uh lots of folks that are challenging the cdc on their official narrative and uh you know quite frankly the steve kirsch is putting up data that the cdc is publishing saying your own safety signal for death was triggered by this vaccine why are you ignoring it and i just think that's so egregious that one thing um anyways the the ongoing uh trop uh, uh charge forward just pushing vaccines endlessly is is very tiring to the community at large i think you're you're well past being able to try and back up the efficacy of them and they're having severe adverse effects across multiple age groups so you don't have to look worldwide to see multiple countries rolling it back so again i i don't see the end point for you i've got it out here on my shirt maybe that's a better one uh, the booster game will never end, uh, and I think the efficacy has totally fallen apart if you actually look at the raw underlying data. So that's been really unfortunate. As long as you continue to 
charge down your lane here with just the vaccine. Everyone has to get vaccinated still. I, it just just underlies the idiocy, and clearly we can see where your dollars are coming from. But it's really unfortunate uh, for anyone that's paying attention to the actual notes in the background. So, so to that or anyone that listens to this, please do not listen to the sole guidance of this group. They've been very one-sided all in all. So thanks much for letting me get on. I hope you guys change your view or get some opposing viewpoints in there. Thank you. Thanks. All right. So now item three back to the legislative priorities all right uh i am very happy to introduce our our colleagues in the commissioner's office um the policy team led by mark resin summer laws our former colleague of public health so very instrumental in a lot of the continued public health work and another colleague from public health nick robles so we're well stacked with uh, expertise in their team. So uh, they've been instrumental in helping us move so much legislation forward for many, many years. And we look forward to an incredibly successful year this year, as you're gonna hear uh, things are definitely lined up for, for success. So um, Mark, I'm not sure if you're kicking things off for your team, but happy to pass it to you. Well, thank you, Wayne, appreciate that. And thank you to Greg and the board for this opportunity to talk with you this evening. Uh, I'll also mention, uh, in addition to Summer and Nick, we have a fourth member of the policy team, Cindy Copeland, who I won't say used to work with public health. Snag all our folks over there. Um, uh, so I, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to work with three former members of the Boulder County Public Health State Policy Team. Um, but we're excited to to be here this evening to provide you with a high level overview of the Boulder County State Legislative Agenda for 2023. The agenda was adopted by the commissioners just last week and uh, Summer, Nick and I are going to talk through some of the high level priorities that uh, the board approved last week. And um, some of you have heard this presentation before, you know that this document it provides a high level and a blueprint uh, uh, guiding the advocacy and lobbying efforts of the county team down at the Colorado General Assembly, uh, both the work of the uh, staff team as well as our fiscal lobbyists who also help us on the state budget side. So we look forward to talking with you a little bit more about the agenda. Um, we, okay, we could go. To, thank you, Jordan, appreciate that. Uh, the state legislative agenda itself is a tool that uh, we've been utilizing in the commissioner's office going back to 2010. Uh, and it identifies a diverse set of core county legislative and state budget priorities uh, that need some support from our state legislative delegation for us to uh, move forward and or achieve. This version of the agenda was updated over the course of the summer and fall of 2022 included many, many meetings, including one with uh, public health staff and the management team, uh, as well as other key internal stakeholders, external stakeholders, key community partners and the like. Uh, and what we're looking to do here is identify new policy priorities based on needs uh, that have emerged over the past year, as well as update the agenda based on uh, the work that was done in the 2022 legislative session. So, um, as I said, we meet with all departments and, and many other uh, important stakeholders for the commissioners to develop the agenda itself. And I should just quickly say that we are going to ping pong between the three of us for the presentation. So I believe Nick is next. And next slide. Yes. Next slide. Thank you. Good evening, Board of Health. Uh, Nick Robles, Policy Advisor. Um, just real quickly about the legislative delegation. Uh, we want to start off thanking Boulder County's outgoing delegation members. Uh, we thank Edie Hooten for her close partnership with Boulder County and especially Boulder County Public Health um, uh, for her work um, addressing many issues, including the challenges affecting people living in manufactured housing communities. And we thank Matt Gray for his leadership on transportation funding legislation and for keeping a watchful eye on the impacts of legislation on local governments. And as a team, we look forward to continuing to work with Tammy Story now that she is the state representative elect for uh, House D District 25 and no longer represents Boulder County. And then below is the list of the um, sworn in, uh, at least the new elect, uh, newly elected sworn in today. Um, 
members of the county's state legislative delegation who will be representing constituents within Boulder County. We are excited to have the opportunity to work with them all when um, or you know, starting today and for the next 120 days. Thank you. Next Thank slide, you. please. And they will just note that um, Representative Tracy Burnett resigned yesterday and there'll be a vacancy committee working to fill her seat. So you may have heard. Uh, so I'm in Summer Laws. I'm also a policy advisor in the commissioner's office and it's great to see you this evening. Uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about our legislative principles. Um, uh, these principles guide the policy team and our county staff in the development of the positions that we take on legislation. We turn to the principles um, and occasions where it feels like it's important for us to engage with a bill, but we, but the legislative agenda policies themselves provide either insufficient or no guidance on a particular issue or what policy uh, position the county should take. So these serve as a guidepost also for examining what potential outcome could be of any potential legislation. And next slide, please. And this examination of the outcome of any piece of le legislation is particularly critical as it comes in as we look at the county's commitment to racial equity. Um, with the Board of County Commissioners direction and through their process of identifying their strategic priorities, we've updated our legislative principles to center racial equity. Um, racial equity and equity are part of, um, as I mentioned, the county strategic priorities, and we hold this principle primary in a review of each piece of legislation and consideration of a position. For example, if a particular piece of legislation reduces or addresses disparate outcomes, we will focus staff resources in our review, analysis, and our advocacy efforts on that piece of legislation. Slide, please. And then I'm going to talk about a few legislative priorities and I'll pass it over to, to discuss a couple of others. So here is we're highlighting a, a few of our legislative priorities. This doesn't address everything that we have prioritized for this next session. We've passed out a handout that we'll also make available. I think we'll be available through the packet. Um, but I'll touch on housing and child welfare. As you well know, affordable housing and housing um, is a critical issue in our community and across the state. And we've long um, taken positions on legislation that helps support increasing the stock of permanently affordable housing, uh, making housing more accessible, addressing renters' issues, especially as it relates to vulnerable renters' rights, and also working on manufactured housing legislation. Though uh, quite a bit of funding was um, there was a, quite a bit of ARPA funding or American Rescue Plan Act funding invested in affordable housing last session. We still um, expect to see quite a bit of um, movement in this area. And then also child welfare is an area where the county is uh, particularly engaged. As you know, the child protection services uh, are within our county human services, housing and human services department. And we feel that all children deserve a safe and permanent and loving home. And so quite a bit of legislation will be seen this year related to child welfare, and we expect to engage on that legislation as well. And with that, I will pass it over to Nick. Yes, thank you, Summer. Um, so speaking, oh, if we can go back to oh, that. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank sorry. you. So we're gonna jump in a little bit deeper to environment and oil and gas and the insurance reform. Uh, so the top environmental, Legislative priorities for this year include legislation to address ongoing ozone non-attainment in the Denver metro region and greenhouse gas emissions from various sources across the state. We know that a number of bills will speak to the climate crisis and air quality, and we're engaging on that legislation. We're particularly supportive of legislation that will bring much needed near-term emission reductions to help resolve our ozone problem, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, sequester carbon and support collaborative efforts between the state and local governments to link transportation planning with land use and housing. In terms of oil and gas, um, Boulder County was heavily engaged with the effort to that led to the passage of Senate Bill 181 in 2019 that brought much needed reforms to how Colorado regulates the oil and gas industry. Uh, for the 2023 count um, session, uh, we look to see revisions to Colorado's force pooling regulations to increase protections for publicly held mineral rights 
and we expect to see legislation introduced in 2023 to address this need. In terms of the homeowners insurance reform, and Boulder County Public Health knows this well, just as the Four Mile and Calwood fires did, the Marshall Fire again revealed the need for homeowners insurance reforms to ensure that Coloradans have access to homeowners insurance and importantly, appropriate fire coverage that accurately reflects the cost to rebuild. We look forward to supporting legislation that Representative Amabile is bringing forward to tackle this issue. Go to the next slide, please. OK. To speak about our state budget principles, our team focuses a significant effort on the state budget because these decisions are critical to our ability to meet local goals and priorities uh, for serving our residents. There are two budget principles that we will center in our advocacy efforts. First, when proposing programs, reforms, and services that will be provided by county government, we ask that the General Assembly provide adequate funding for these staffing and administrative costs associated with those efforts. Oftentimes, these changes cannot be effectively implemented without adequate and sustainable funding. Secondly, we have seen many attempts to save Coloradans money by reducing fees. We support fee relief as it relates to career opportunities or economic relief for those economically disadvantaged, we, but we feel that fees should be maintained or increased where appropriate to address state staffing or other program needs and to ensure that regulated industries pay the fees that allow regulatory programs to reach cost recovery. Next slide, please. I'll zoom in a little bit more into our state specific a few states budget priorities, starting out with human services. Um, I think we've we've expressed here previously that we work closely with uh, budget lobbyists from Policy Matters for a lot of uh, our lobbying efforts at uh, the Joint Budget Committee and down at the legislature. And that's just to ensure, just as Nick mentioned, that uh, the county has adequate funding for many of the programs that we administer for the state. Um, our, our team's engagement starts with that process in the year prior to any legislative session. Uh, we work with many partners to share our county priorities with the state departments, key, key stakeholders, and the Joint Budget Committee. And then we continue our advocacy efforts through the development of the governor's budget, the budget supplemental process, which has started this month, and also the development and passage of the long bill. Um, so I'll just highlight, as I mentioned, a few of those priorities. Um, as you're probably well aware, um, County Human Service Department um, helps administer programs like Medicaid, SNAP, also known as Food Stamps, TANF, and other programs that are critical to supporting people with lower incomes, especially which has been especially important during this time of inflation and increased cost of living. Recently, there's both the Nine News and CPR re reports of severe delays in receiving SNAP benefits in some parts of Colorado due to staffing shortages. Um, and even though Boulder County is currently understaffed, we are not experiencing delays, but our staff and human services are working nights, weekends, overtime to try to make sure that people are receiving their much needed benefits in time um, in, on time. So we believe in providing that prompt and effective public service is critical. So we're going to be uh, pursuing a budget supplemental to address county is what's called county administration to help cover those costs so that we can continue to retain and recruit workforce in that area. Additionally, uh, there's a priority for local public health agents, uh, agency funding um, this session with the, with the Joint Budget Committee and just ensuring that we continue to receive much of the funding. We'll work closely with Jennifer Miles on uh, that effort because um, we know similarly that public health has been uh, challenged with um, retaining and recruiting staff, just like many other employers in Colorado. And then finally, we'll continue to lobby for funding that supports wildfire mitigation to prevent catastrophic wildfires in our communities. As we know, investments in, in mitigation and prevention saves lives, property, and firefighting resources. Next slide. Next slide. Thank you. So uh, the county's advocacy work at the Capitol is built on a foundation of collaboration and coalitions. As you saw on the previous slide, we have eight members of the general assembly of the 100 members total that represent some portion of Boulder County, three in the House and 
uh, five, I'm sorry, five in the House and three in the Senate. Um, we're actually excited to see Tammy's story having moved over to the House. So now it feels like we have even one more member in the House because she spent so many years representing Boulder County uh, on, the, uh, on the Senate, in the Senate, and now we'll be in the House uh, for the next two years. Uh, over the course of the legislative session, we'll lobby probably 150 bills or so of the 600 or so that are introduced. Um, and then we'll be uh, working with our fiscal lobbyists to lobby the full bu state budget package. So there's a lot of ground to cover. And really the best way to, to do that is to maximize your leverage by working with others who share similar perspectives. Um, undoubtedly, you saw CALFO on that list uh, as a partner organization for the county. Um, our commissioners and staff play a key role in leading the work of counties and commissioners acting together, CCAT, as well as Colorado Communities for Climate Action, CC4CA. So uh, those two organizations and the organizations listed below are um, great opportunities for the county to leverage its influence at the Capitol and, and move policy and bills in the direction that we'd like to see. So uh, we're excited to uh, work with CALFO. We have worked with Jennifer Miles in a variety of ways over the years, and it's just a real pleasure to work with Lane and Joe and the entire public health team on uh, issues that overlap uh, and are supported by the commissioners and meet goals and priorities of the commissioners as well as public health. So uh, we have a great working relationship, have had for years, and look forward to continuing that in the next session. Um, unless Summer and Nick have more they'd like to add, that's the state legislative agenda in, uh, in general. Uh, we're expecting a busy, exciting, fascinating session. I think having been down in the building this morning, uh, as they all got started, uh, it's like, you know, put on your seatbelts and enjoy the ride. It's going to be kind of crazy for the next 120 days. Uh, it, it will lots of big questions being asked by legislators down there. It'll be interesting to see the interplay between the General Assembly and the governor. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if the governor changes his approach to governance now that he's in his second term and not longer in his first term. Theoretically, anyway, not running for office in Colorado, but maybe elsewhere. I don't know. Uh, so it, it's just going to be really interesting to watch. We have a clear set of priorities, which is what the ledge agenda gives us. That's what we'll be focusing our time and energy on. Uh, we look forward to working with public health uh, in that journey over the next 120 days, and we'll look forward to continuing to report back to you all on that work. I should mention that the public health staff play a key role in what we call our Human Services Policy Committee, which provides guidance to the policy team on anything and everything related to human services legislation, which is the biggest part of our portfolio down at the Capitol. Uh, and so we're really thankful for the staff that contribute to that work and provide guidance to us ongoing during the legislative session itself, in addition to just the accessibility of the public health staff, because we'll be emailing in some cases probably daily on things that are happening down under the Gold Dome. So happy to answer any questions about uh, the agenda itself, uh, the work that we do in support of the county and the commissioners, and happy to be here this evening. Thank you. I got a couple questions. Okay, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not running the meetings. So. <laughs> uh, uh, um, so two questions. One is, um, Nick, you mentioned that in this legislative um, priority list, it mentions um, anticipated like legislation around air quality. Do you know what that's going to look like? Like how they're going to try to address air quality or economic climate? Uh, <laughs> so we, uh, the reason why we're yes. pausing is because yeah. Cindy Copeland is uh, our expert in air quality, who is yeah. your expert in air quality, right. um, who is currently at a conference in D.C. And she would normally answer the details behind that legislation, but um, we can yeah. cover like yeah. an overview. Yeah. Yeah. In, in short, we're working to uh, buttress the uh, work of the Air Quality Control Commission and the state implementation plan that they adopted in December which we know is woefully inadequate. So you'll see legislative efforts to add some more teeth to the SIP. There's an interesting uh, nuance here in Colorado in respect to the state implementation plan for ozone that's different than many other states. The General Assembly actually has to approve that SIP that was adopted by the AQCC and might provide some opportunities uh, at the very least for legislators to weigh in on um, the, the 
quality of the SIP um, that was adopted by the AQCC and plans for moving forward. And we know there's a lot of work happening in 2023. Greg, you're very familiar with what's going to be happening in that space. So um, um, we'll see maybe two or three or four bills that'll speak to directly to air quality um, that relate to the ozone non-attainment and emissions reduction in general. Uh, and Cindy's been at the table and all those bills helping draft those bills. Um, ironically enough, Representative Burnett was leading much of that work. And um, so where that will go from now is a bit unknown, although uh, to her credit, Rep Burnett was uh, setting the table for other legislators to take up her bills, knowing that it was likely she wouldn't be able to continue. So uh, so I wouldn't say uh, perhaps there's a little bump in the road there, but I think we'll be OK and that legislation will move forward. Uh, but it's primarily going to be focused on bringing some teeth to um, the SIP that was adopted by the AQCC. Yeah. Can I ask one other question? Just, um, you know, usually you can anticipate one or two sort of big pieces of legislation that are going to be battled out. What do you what do you think those are going to be on? What are you anticipating those are going to be on this year? <laughs> what? I Go think for it. It. I, I think we're going to give you the same answer. Yeah. But. <laughs> I think that when we did when we talked about housing, that we know that there's been to be um, legislation that talk, speaks to the intersection of land use, housing, transit, <laughs> climate, but also local governance and how um, how that plays out at the local level. And there's several conversations being led by the executive branch regarding that topic. And so I think that may be one of the biggest pieces of uh, packages that comes forward. Currently we're hearing that would be three bills um, and we're hearing about different components, but we really feel strongly that local government should be at the table just because we're in the business of implementing and have kind of a general idea of of um, obviously what works and what doesn't. But also, we also understand that local control isn't the only answer that we're willing to participate and really come up with creative solutions. So it, I think it'll be a really interesting conversation this session. So it's a, it's, is it, would I be correct in saying that the state is trying to push for a more expansive involvement, not just relying on local control or hearing locals go, no, no, don't tell us what to do, especially if you're not giving us money, because otherwise you've got a smattering of locals who are moving the needle. And then you've got others who say, we don't want anything to do with it. Yeah, I, you know, I think what we're hearing is that the state would potentially set some land use policies that okay. normally sit at the at the local yeah. level. Well, that will be a fun battle. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. As you all know, Colorado is built on the foundation of local control, and if the state's going to step into a policy space, it's got to feel really compelled to do that. And there are many people from the governor on down who feel that the situation around housing, around transportation, uh, has reached a point where the state needs to step in and, and, re and engage rather than just uh setting goals and priorities and hopes that the locals will implement mm. uh some local governments will be much more open to that message than others and it'll be very interesting to see how that conversation plays out at the capitol but you put your finger on it greg that's generally going to be the discussion and yes if you hear um yeah it's going to be really that's one of those pieces that will be really interesting uh -huh. and former board of health member sonia jaquez lewis is in the mix uh, in these conversations uh, it's quite possible that she will be running one of the bills that may emerge from these the conversations down in Denver right now. Uh, so we're actively engaging in conversations with Sonia about what that might look like and with other key partners as well. But yeah, that that may be the biggest package of bills that generates the most interest okay. uh, and um, drama, so to speak, down in, in Denver. I have a question on your partnerships. Mm -hmm. so there are several state environmental partnerships listed up there. What about mental health? Do we have a lot of statewide mental health partnerships or do those just not exist? We do work closely with Mental Health Colorado, mm -hmm. um, but I would say that Mental Health Colorado, this and they're probably one of the largest uh, statewide organizations, especially that's engaged in legislative work. This session, they're running a bill that uh, I, I'm not sure how 
I, I would think there will be challenges given the fiscal note of the bill, but they want to really expand access to um, behavioral health services for uh, children and youth on Medicaid for issues that um, kind of encompass the whole social determinants of health spectrum. So it would be less difficult for that for folks to be able to access behavioral health. So that'd be something that we're supporting. They're also trying to uh, address stigma around mental and behavioral health access and also eating disorders. Um, but in terms of big work around behavioral health with the behavioral health administration still going through all their rulemaking and structuring, we're finding that most people are engaging at um, that level and so with other counties we're we're meeting with the um, BHA director monthly just to kind of weigh in on what we're seeing at the local level in terms of access because there's still so many challenges and how is that going to play out in their process of developing the BHA I think one criticism was it created a lot of administration but really how are we going to see the access addressed so I'd say that those are kind of the two places we're most engaged right now did you, I, I don't know, did Rep Amabile put forward any mental health bills this year, behavioral health bills? She will probably be bringing through, she, I know that she's bringing several pieces of legislation for that we were engaging with almost every single one of those bills. Um, because of her work on the interim committee of treatment of persons within the criminal justice system of those with behavioral health, mental health or substance abuse disorders, she's bringing a couple of bills for that way around competency, juvenile competency. Um, we're engaging on a bill uh, that's more related to child welfare that she's running. Um, and there's there are several others. And as you know, she primarily focuses on access for people with severe mental illness. Um, and so I think we expect to see kind of continued engagement in that area. And interestingly, the Colorado National Association of Social Workers, their lobbyists are frontline public affairs. So Jennifer Miles okay. right, is also working with them. So working on a lot of similar issues, but with that social work mental health focus. Okay. Yeah. Any uh, kind of seismic changes in LPHA funding, or is this really kind of nibbling around the edges still? It's really, I think, pretty small, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> um, I think there was a there was a budget request already, you know, from the state to address LPH funding and what Calvo I think is trying to attain is basically to double that. It's, that was a smaller amount, but just to ensure that the increase kind of covers. Um, I, I think it was a provider rate increase, but also covers all the funding that LPHA has received, not just a portion of it. So that's what um, she's that Calvo is pursuing now. And then another thing that's kind of interesting with the state budget this year is that the provider rate increase is really variant across departments. Usually you see a provider rate increase that's the same across all departments. And so there's a lot of dis disparity, I would say. And, um, and that provider rate increase just covers anything the state might be paying for outside of what the state service is. And so like for HICPUF, we saw 0.5% increase for a lot of providers. And in um, Department of Human Services, so the 2% with you know, keeping in mind that we had about approximately 7% inflation last year. So what we've seen in the governor's budget overall is this kind of not really covering just the basic functions and of government and a lot of new ideas coming forward in this budget. And that's a little challenging for us working on the ground who are implementing all the things that continue and just, you know, haven't, we haven't seen kind of uh, a real focus on addressing the issues. That, that may be another area where you see some serious conversation at the Capitol is the whole issue of funding and taxation. Um, where everyone's preparing for a downturn and the state revenue forecast is already trending that way. Um, so it's uh, just a lead potentially to leaner times, not to mention that we have the impending end of the public health emergency, right? So there's going to be a lot of pressure put on locals and government in general. And if we see an economic downturn and an increase in demand for state services, while of course the revenues are going in the opposite direction, it makes for a really difficult uh, space to work in. And we just decreased our income taxes. 
Yes. Yes. A lot of voters shoot ourselves in the foot all the time, it seems like. But um, so those are those will be some of the dynamics. But with the significant majorities in the Democratic caucus in both chambers, um, it's like it's possible you may see some serious conversations around Tabor and trying to get out from under some of the some of the hamstrings that have been put on the state budget and the state budgeting process. Um, we'll see though, right? I mean, those are big, big issues to deal with. And um, but but perhaps now with, with those sizable majorities, there's space to have those conversations in a serious way. Uh, we're thankful that Steve Fenberg is still the Senate president. He's um, a great ally for the county and does a great job managing the Senate and through CCAD and other relationships. We have good working relationships with the speaker and leadership in the House. So it, uh, I think we're well positioned to be part of conversations and hopefully influential in conversations, uh, staff, but but our commissioners as well. And I should add Ashley Stoltzman, who will be sworn in tomorrow, is very active um, as uh, on the local level and in the local government sphere, of course, being on the Louisville City Council and Louisville Mayor for the last number of years. So all three of our commissioners are taking leadership roles uh, in the legislative space, and we're looking forward to having working with them and moving having them engage with some of these conversations that are moving forward at the state level. Any other questions? Well, thank you. Um, yeah, it should be. Should be a good time. Uh, this session. The, the other thing to remember, right, is sometimes you have to introduce the ideas. Have people shoot a bunch of holes on them. And then you bring it back next session, right? Because we won't have a gubernatorial election for another several years. So if if, it, if the groundwork gets laid this time, then the refinements can happen, and hopefully next session uh, we'll have a better handle, hopefully on the revenues and uh, the willingness to be even more progressive. So yeah. thank you. Yep. <clears throat> Thank you very much. All right. Thanks. Good, good to you. see you. We always love coming to Board of Health once a year. Yeah. Good to see you in person. And Greg, uh, our uh, our ASCO staff is that the Board of Health um, also adopt those legislative priorities, which helps the staff in public health uh, be nimble and react and uh, and move forward on legislation. Um, and it also keeps us pretty consistent um, policy wise with our commissioners. And again, I think that legislative document is very encompassing and has has really the, the key areas public health is focused on as well. The other thing I just want to add, because um, this came up last year and Lane, you had sent some communication to the board. It was really helpful. But if there are opportunities for the board to support the work that you're doing at the Capitol, either by emailing or testifying or whatever, um, those are it's great for us to know about those. So and Lane and I are planning to share more about that piece in February. Also, yeah. Thank you. OK, so we have an action item approval and adoption of the 2023 Boulder County State Legislative and Budget Priorities. I move that we approve and adopt Boulder County Legislative Priorities. 2023 legislative session. Second. Okay, motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. Yes, thank you so thank much. You, Lane. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. All righty. Um, I think this next item, Kate, uh, can you help us with this next item? So, is this to be what? Remind me, Kate, what was Lexi's appointment timeline? It sounds like we need to extend that. When did it expire or does it expire? Has it expired yet? You're on mute, Kate. I, I would need to take a look. Um, can we maybe like circle back to me? Or, or Catherine, maybe Catherine, you can help us or. I'm 
I mean, are, so we, we, Lexi are was, we just Lexi was discussing an interim executive right. director for six months starting July, July something? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, so we we're technically expect, expired. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And now we need to it's extend the appointment. To extend, which if it gets approved, then I will then let HR know. They will post it and then it's extended. Okay. Yeah. So then are we just going to say extended until position is filled? So now this is the second go round. So the first one is six months. This one can go on. Okay. But, yeah. I don't want so it. that's I think the way we want it. Yes. You know, extended until filled. <laughs> I don't think we really have any, uh, any discussion on that, do we? I mean that no, we need, we need everybody. We need this to happen. Okay. Yeah. All right. Then does somebody want to make a motion? Yes, I move that we extend the appointment of the interim executive director until the executive director position is filled. I second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Ooh, item five, Board of Health election for president. Uh, well, just, just uh, to recap in case uh, folks don't know, so this is my last eight months, seven months on the board. Um, I am termed out. Uh, this is my 11th year. I actually got to serve an extra year because I filled somebody's vacancy. Um, so, and with the important business of hiring a new executive director to um, ably lead this organization forward, um, I think it would be best for me not to be president in 2023 because I will not be able to serve a full term. Currently, Morgan McMillan is our vice president. Um, that doesn't mean that she has to move up if she doesn't want to, but um, you know, I'll leave it up to you folks to discuss. To we nominate? You could nominate, sure. Can I nominate? Would <laughs> <laughs> well, like you want? Just to clarify, I thought that this was for September. It says in the notes that it's for September, Greg, sure. that you would be yeah. serving. Oh. Did you? Is that to you? I think. Oh, I mean, so I can still be president. <laughs> I, your term ends I, mean, I just don't want to do. I, I, I don't. Mean, I don't mind doing yeah. that. I just don't want it to disrupt the flow. Right. Of uh, you know sometimes. Because we're at the start of this executive director hiring, mm -hmm. I almost wonder if the experience gained. Yeah. We're all going to be in the same room. Right. I, I do think that it would be helpful if whoever's serving in the president role is in that role when the new ED starts. So that we don't, like if they start in May yeah. and you're still president right. and then that transitions a couple months later, that doesn't feel like that makes a lot of sense. Right. I don't think, Kate, you can uh, chime in if you want to, but I don't think there's any like, Le le legislation or like limits or bylaws. Um, yeah. Kate, is there anything about how long someone can serve as president? Or yeah, if Greg wants to step down. No, but know. I mean, if yeah. if I transitioned out in June, I mean, I could do that anyway. It's happened before. So, okay. Well, that's that's an interesting concept. Um, you know, I would just say that I like. Lexi serving as an interim until the position is filled, I would be willing to serve as president until the position is filled. But once that person starts, then I want to transition. Yeah, that's all. Like Unless you want to be president. It's salivating. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Well, um, does that change anybody's? I guess I would say I'll put my hat in the ring for president until the new permanent executive director starts. Well, I think you already are. That's right. I don't yeah, do we think you need to on. vote on you, it. We still need to vote on who's going to be. Okay. I, I still need to like throw my hat in the ring and we all still need to approve um, it. I think but should we, I guess I'm just wondering like the why we're having this conversation. Like I was wondering this when I read the notes, I was like, this is in the future. So is it that we agree? It, like, do we need a vote tonight is what I'm asking. I was thinking yes. it might be good to vote on who the next president will be. Okay. Because 
I think it would be helpful if there were some roles shared or some discussion and so that it was clear and that we weren't voting in the moment that we get a new executive director. Okay. Kate, does that, does that present any procedural problems? Yeah, so we do actually have some detailed bylaws in this area, not to say that can't have a discussion and reach a consensus at this meeting, um, but the bylaws do provide that board officers will be elected annually at the October meeting or at the first board meeting after the occurrence of a vacancy involving a board officer. Newly elected officers shall assume office at the conclusion of the meeting at which elected. So the official election would take place at the meeting after um, Greg vacates the office. And Greg, you can step down from president, you know, and still continue serving your term on the board. Right, right. Okay. Well, if that makes life easier, then I'm willing to do that. We could straw poll it though for who would be the next president so that there can be a transition. So yeah, so that's smooth and we don't have to, then we don't have to even discuss it at that meeting. Just vote. That sounds good. Okay. So Greg, sorry, we you clarify what you're putting on the table? I'm not following. I'm <laughs> taking I would put on the table continually serving as president until the new executive director actually starts. Okay, and then you would at that point step down as president, That's continue as board member until the end of your term, assuming that those things that happened before then. Really and then you would officially do the next president at that time. Um, but it's also possible that you know you would get somebody in here, let's say August, right? Because they'll have to recruit for my position in advance of that. So you may have a new board member in the mix. And depending on their expertise and experience, they might want to throw their hat in the ring. You know, that's kind of what I'm thinking is I just think this is like the cart before, like, I don't know why we're having, you know what I mean? Okay. Just from a timing well, perspective, and it's, then it's news to me that we had elections in October. We it seemed like we've always done this in January. Um, you don't remember that glorious moment when we gave you the trophy? <laughs> but now I'm I'm fine to keep things going the, the way they are uh, for the foreseeable future. So, do we need a vote on that, Kate? No, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, status quo. Well, that was an interesting agenda item. Um, okay, and then uh, we are on to item six in the director's report. Um, we, haven't, we haven't discussed the director's report in a couple months, uh, mainly due to time constraints, but uh, feel free. We do have a little bit of time now. Sure. Just. Uh... Pull that baby up and remind myself. So um, we did talk a little bit about some of the experiences of the holidays, um, which were you know, lively as um, <laughs> per the usual in Boulder County since I've been here. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. We, um, uh, Joe Malinowski and Bill Hayes, uh, were representing BCPH at the Boulder City Council meeting last uh Thursday to answer questions. So last Thursday, I think to answer to answer questions about the um, interpretation of the findings of meth residue in the library. Um, we are currently working on some risk communication for the public that will help them better understand um, what level of risk this presents. Um, we, we are a little concerned with some misinformation that is circulating in some spaces that we will be working on addressing. Um, we uh, also are uh, thinking carefully about um, the, you know, the possibility that if um, migrants were to arrive in Boulder County, what would that mean for BCPH in terms of our own um, responsibilities and staffing responses? Um, I have been working hard on having conversations with the county commissioners. I've had a, I've been able to have some one-on-one -on -one conversations with them about what some of our priorities are, and we are looking at how we can continue to build relationships between the Board of Health and the commissioners in the coming year. We've got some ideas that you'll be hearing about soon. Um, the Regional Opioids Council 
um, did pass a first round of funding um, with some um, uh, very uh, appreciated asks that were approved from Boulder County Public Health, um, and we should be able to share those soon. Um, and uh, you'll hear more soon from Lane and Heather about how we are also um, kind of taking the list, um, not just the county's priority list, but breaking it down into a little bit more um, detail of what uh, Boulder County Public Health's own legislative interests are, how we're going to track that and bring it back to you all um, with specifics going forward. I'm happy to answer any other questions or we have our, our teams online also if you have divisional specific questions. I was curious about the math. So is the library reopened yet? Or no? It has reopened for exchanges um, of books, and I think it's it's going to reopen soon if it hasn't already. It opened today. It opened today. So no more okay. public restrooms. No right. More public restrooms. So <laughs> yeah, they're not so using it was in the ventilatory ventilation system, right? That's right. Yeah. There were a couple of spots um, where there were readings that were above the threshold or doing something. Um, the highest ones were 75 micrograms, um, but you know we get regular readings in houses that are at 2000, so it's all relative. Um, there's some interesting challenges with the way that the regulations are written that we're starting to take a closer look at in terms of you know, what's the evidence base for human harm? That's, that's what I, that's where I was headed. Yeah, so that's part of the <laughs> problem. I yeah. really just wonder a lot about the fear mongering and Whatever. marginalization of certain people when there's really not, I mean, I'm, I don't want anyone using in the bathroom. Well, sure. You know, right next to the library either, but it seemed pretty low levels to me. Right. Um, that, you know, it's really not presenting much of a risk to the population. Yes. It's evidence that people have used in the bathroom. But I would be careful communicating about that because there is a large, there's a very negative community reaction to being told that there's a, we've surpassed a threshold and that's the problem. And not that the problem, it, and that the problem is not that there's being meth smoked in the bathroom. So I know, and I, I don't think this was specific to Joe's presentation, uh, but just to be cautious as a community health department, as we just talked about image and things like that with Dr. Right. Um, not to minimize the community concern that regardless of the amount of meth that was smoked, there is an issue that meth was smoked in the library. I just think people sometimes feel like it's being minimized and that's what I, yeah, I, I mean, I don't want to minimize the meth issues in the community, but it's sort of like it's akin to the the accusations that, or the um, allegations that police officers are are getting high and and not breathing because they touched a patient who had used fentanyl that pretty much have been disproven and I and I just worry about you know there's more fear around substance use. I mean, not saying that we shouldn't be addressing substance use, but it's if you're not using directly, it's really not. I mean, we, we really do need more facts and we right. need more studies in this yeah. space. There's not enough evidence. That's what I was going to ask um, you. Is what the, like the sta are there standards around this or is it fairly loose at the moment in terms of? So there are, there are some interesting questions about where the standards came from um, and who uh, developed them. Um, we are currently collecting a lot of the evidence base as much as we can find, um, including how to effectively communicate it. I think I think, Brooke, that your points are very well taken. It doesn't feel good to be told. Oh, yeah, we found meth, but don't worry about it. Well, um, this is everywhere. I mean, if you go to right. the bathroom and in McDonald's, the, you're probably exactly. exposed to more meth in the public library, but they're not checking for it. Well, I, guess, <laughs> I mean, part, yeah, of, part saying, of what we see. I don't know if that's, that's going to help the community feel better. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Right. Part of yeah. what we see is all the potential help and fortune <laughs> would be is that everyone starts to rush out to test and then spends millions of right. dollars yes. remediating spaces without a way that will keep it clean 
or that will be sustainable and without spending that money on addressing the problem. I, I'm more worried about um, the public health issue of not having the library available during negative 14 yeah, weather right. and you know not having a public space for families and and the message that that sends. Or that we know. have no public bathrooms for people. Or that you are spraying when not allowing you to use the rent. You can't go to the public They are going to, they, um, the children's bathrooms are open and available. Yeah. You have to go through security, but it, that we don't have a public bathroom yeah. for someone to use. And so, it's, yeah, I don't, I wouldn't want to minimize it, but I also, there's, you know, that's everywhere. It, there's, it's a fine line and, <laughs> and we're consulting some experts on that, now on how to, to do that communication. It sounds like, Lexi, one, I'm sorry, Greg, one of the follow ups is to actually help shore up what the guidelines might be, the evidence and potential changes to policies and procedures as a result of this. I, I think it, um, you know, this incident made some national news yep. and there it is very quite a well response known. that's yep. happening um, yes. nationally that I think is going to drive uh, a spotlight onto the issue and onto um, a re-examination of the standards, maybe with a finer tooth comb than they had before. Yeah. Okay. If there's, a, and again, I like you know, I throw this out only if it's helpful. If there's an opportunity for the board to support a communication, also like a guest piece in the camera or something that goes out on next door that sort of also offers some follow up to these are the actual health risks versus you know, and these are this is a larger problem in our community that needs to be addressed. I think that communication. Thank you. Yeah. Helpful. Yeah, I think really it comes down to what's the health risk, yeah. right? And, um, and who developed We, we went through that with fentanyl and the transit police and the police on and the bus drivers. And it's just like, you know, I'm not the expert on that, but, you know, just talking to various people, it seems like that's where we came out in the end was the level of risk was low. It wasn't that it's an issue. It's not an issue. It's the level of risk was low. And I don't know where these I'm, I'm just searching. I don't know where these guidelines came from, but what agenda was who? What was the agenda of the people who developed these guidelines? You know, was this developed in like? What era of the guidelines and based on what level of exposure? I, I, I agree. Like, I agree with all of this. And you definitely want to let people know what their actual level of risk is. But again, I'd be very careful. It has, there has been a perception that it has been presented as that the meth smoking in the bathroom was not an issue. And that testing did occur after meth smoking was observed in that restroom. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand now it's spiraling out of control where everybody wants to test everything. Uh, but just, I think it's a very fine line. You don't want to dismiss the concerns of the community. Yeah. Just yeah. And I, the, I, as, the person as a parent who has used the library with kids, I don't want people smoking meth yeah. in the bathrooms and maybe having a, a key, like some sort of process to get into the bathrooms. It's what we need. But I think the absolute risk to the community in entering the bathrooms is exceptionally low. I understand that one, and I think that, but I think those are two separate issues. Yeah, agreed. Mm -hmm. uh, Lexi, would this be an opportunity to maybe in a future board meeting bring um, the work that public health is doing around, uh, uh, what am I trying to say, addiction and substance use, drug use, and, yeah, and just maybe as a reminder of the things we're doing that, that you know, in, tangentially are addressing some of the concerns that this race raises, because it's not just about specific incident so of course nephews in general right so okay. yes and <laughs> um, uh, certainly mental and behavioral health is a top priority for bcph this year um we have um programs that work in that space what we don't have is a unified strategic plan nor one that it is, you know, really kind of beautifully connected to the work of our partners, and that's what we're trying to get towards this year. The other challenge is that um, almost all of our funding in this space is grant funded, um, and it's not enough to even begin to touch the need. Um, we, I think we have maybe 
0.2 FTE of a person whose job is to respond to the meth issues, um, which is insufficient for the task at hand. Um, so we're trying to think carefully about how we resource this suddenly urgent needed need um, that, you know, uh, has, you know, it's not, it doesn't, it's not beyond us to recognize that Colorado has, you know, we know Colorado has not done a good job of funding this space. Um, we're 51st, um, but uh, it is absolutely at the top of our list of um, priorities for 2023. And interestingly, it came up as one of the major legislative priorities that was discussed this evening as well at the state yeah. level. So. I think it's really challenging because there's not a suboxone for meth. And the debate in the, in the addiction world around harm reduction for meth often involves prescription of other stimulants because almost half of people who use meth chronically are diagnosed with ADHD. So there, there's a lot of overlap there and a lot of debate, but there's a lot of discomfort in the medical community, I can tell you, around prescription stimulants to help right. meth. And there's no, I don't think there's a public health department level, you know, solution for that. There's, you can't, there's no, overdoses are thankfully relatively rare, not zero, but, you know, you can have strokes and other issues, but it's not that you can't, there are no Narcan machines for right. meth overdose, so it's a much more complicated picture. Well, and I wonder, Lexi and Board, if it's helpful to just highlight broadly our substance abuse prevention work. That's what I was going to say. In the context of this, what are we? Because right. like one. Just highlighting. Some yeah, of and I, I, you know, that is what we are working on. We're hoping to have a public health improvement plan. Um, to share with you all uh, in the spring. Um, we certainly do have programs now that work on prevention, um, particularly with youth, um, as well as um, harm reduction. Um, but, uh, but it is feeling like the current conversation is getting a little outside of the work that we have been resourcing and committing to. But I think it, yeah, I think as we as we get a little bit further along, um, it'll be great to share with you kind of what our our established programs are, as well as where we're trying to um, deepen and connect um, some of the work. Yeah, and I think it just highlights the priorities, right? We have finite resources. Yeah. And there's not so a clear, gets a lot of PR attention. That do. doesn't necessarily mean that that's what gets prioritized from a public health, you know. And even if you had all the resources, there's not a clear path forward other than prevention. Um, I just wanted to, in this context, acknowledge and um, just publicly thank the staff during the holidays. We got an astounding email mm -hmm. about all of the things that were going on during a time when many people are off work and enjoying time with their families. And the staff clearly is working very hard on a lot of really critical issues for the community. So I just wanted to personally say thank you to the staff for everything you guys did during that time. Always thank you, but that's a particularly difficult time to be working that hard. You're here. Thank you. Yeah. I have one other question about the um, Healthy Kids Colorado survey. I don't know if you work on that, but or there's two. <laughs> Elise is on there. Too. Oh, OK, great. Uh, <laughs> Well, so and because years ago, St. Brain Valley Schools opted out of the survey. Correct. What's the status? They still do they do their own survey? They still conduct their own internal survey. Um, we have tried for many years to see the survey to get results from the survey. Um, some of it is shared at their um, school board meetings, um, but it's not shared out publicly. And they don't coordinate. Um, cooperate with public health on that? It's not shared out with any partners outside of the district, as far as I'm aware. Um, just what we've been able to glean through specific projects that we've worked with them on. One of our uh, managers, Jax Gonzalez, with the OASIS program is now on the St. Brain Equity Committee that they have. So we're hopeful that some information will be shared through, through that space. 
Is there a reason why they opt out? There was a reason, yeah. And I'm just, I was sort of curious as to why, I mean, whether or not things have changed because it's been years since they opted out and a lot of it, they just, they had some issue with the way the questions were asked and I think the data was presented. The way the data was presented and shared out. Um, and there had historically been some comparisons between the two districts. Mm -hmm. um, so I have not seen any movement around change. I know Lexi was maybe going to approach <laughs> district leadership to just have a, a, a renewed conversation. Yeah, I think there's an op always an opportunity to explore if there, you know, if anything shifted there. Yep. New so unfortunately, we just we have regional data, which is BVSD and Broomfield County, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and then we have just BVSD for for the county. So as far as we know, St. Brain hasn't done anything internally on their own either. They have. They They're have. doing their own questionnaire, I think. They, just they do share it. The the they do a questionnaire um, and they share out parts of it okay. usually each year. So um, cigarette kind of use meeting. or marijuana use, is there, are those still questions? Um, I have seen some questions more so around student safety. Okay. Um, I haven't seen as many specifics on like specific health areas okay. such as that. Um, but again, I haven't I haven't seen it and I know the folks I've worked with have not had permission to share outside of the district. But advancing MBH through our partnerships with the schools is obviously, you know, it's a really important part of the way that we do the work. And so I think insofar as BCPH is hoping to take a deeper dive, hoping to um, capture some additional resources to develop in that space, there may be, you know, there could be some new um, opportunities for us to collaborate. Sam Brain has been really interested in discussions around student mental health, and uh, we've had some monthly meetings with their district leadership um, that some of our mental health related nonprofits are also a part of just to talk about how to support students and staff. Um, and they last year was the first time in several years they'd hosted one and they're hosting again in March uh, a resource fair for all of their counselors and interventionists to learn about what like mental health type resources that exist. Um, so we're still furthering the work. Yeah, and I would think that there's some, I mean, they do have, St. Brain has some pretty well-developed like parent leadership groups, right, that are focused on equity mm -hmm. within the district that might be good partners in terms of approaching the district for partnering on a lot of the work related to mental and behavioral health mm -hmm. and safety. And... Um, Thanks. Any other questions on director's report? All right, let's see. Uh, old and new business. So speaking of surveys, I was curious. Um, does the county or the department do like, I don't know what you call them, pulse surveys, engagement surveys, surveys of the staff to feel like, you know, get a sense for what things are going well and what things aren't? Yes, and in fact, um, the county just um, finished um, not only the analysis of the staff engagement survey from a number of months ago, but the group's recommendations. It includes 16 recommendations on what we can do to um, strengthen staff engagement, which I was planning to include in our next director's report meeting. If that's um, of interest, if you'd like some time on the agenda to talk about it too, we can do that. It's up to you. Um, I've been trying to keep the the uh, agenda pretty light for you right now, um, knowing how way leads on to way. But if that's something you would specifically like to have a conversation about, we're happy to include that in the next agenda. I think I would like to hear about it. Yeah, I think I would too. I think okay. with the upcoming hiring process, somebody, I, I think it would be really it. good to have what's the latest snapshot. Well, this is that's countywide. It's county, county. It's countywide, and it's yeah. from last May. Oh. <laughs> so the recommendations, maybe the report. Yeah. Put it in the report. Yeah, that's fine. Let's put it in the report, and we'll ask questions. Yeah. And, and it's not specific to public yeah. health. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, but good to read it and then yeah. If, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, we should they also... break it out by department. I, I think it's nice to know county wide what's going on because it all. Yeah. You know, I can find out if they'll if they'll send us public health specific stuff. Um, the other thing I'll mention is that um, we're trying to compile a uh, a public health snapshot of the GARE survey, which is the racial equity survey um, that we can also include in next month's report. Um, they're kind of working in parallel on those two pieces. We just thought about that today with our public health associates. Um, our CDC yes, and they're going to work on taking that data and putting it in a more digestible format. And I think we talked about having it done February 2nd, so that would be in time. Just in time. <laughs> and I apologize. I have a soccer game, so oh, right. Right. good luck. Thank you. Good to see you all. Good to see okay. you there. I'll, I'll get back to you tomorrow, Heather, on your okay. email. Thanks. Perfect. Um, Okay, that's it for all the new business. Uh, request for a vote to approve future executive sessions. This is item eight. To discuss personnel matters related to the executive director position under the CRS. These executive sessions will be held at the end of each regular meeting through February. With regular meetings held the second Monday as normal. I didn't see. Yeah, it. I think that is that last month's agenda. Last month. Oh, I think we already voted on that. Yeah, yeah. Right. Four. I was like, oh, yeah. Wow. I think we already approved. Maybe I should resign this press. So we got your back, right? I was like, Greg, I was like, well, I was like, 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 I